Hello, good afternoon everyone, and welcome to this press conference on the final vote on whistleblowers. Uh, the European Parliament has just uh, adopted new EU-wide rules to give better protection to whistleblowers. The new rules were adopted with an overwhelming majority, uh, 591 in favour, 29 against and 33 abstentions. With no further ado, I'll give the floor to the rapporteur on this file. Madame Roussière, vous avez la parole. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I'll speak French, but uh, if you want to ask uh, in other languages, that's fine. So this is a great way to come to the end of this parliament uh, with the final vote on the Protection of Whistleblowers Directive. As uh, you've just heard, there was an um, overwhelming majority. Uh, it's been a long wait for the protection of whistleblowers, uh, and we finished working on this on the parliament side uh, a while ago. Then there were the trilogues and there's the formal vote. I mean, it, it's taken 13 months, I think, overall, if I remember correctly. I think uh, the proposal was uh, March or April. So I guess just, yeah, just a year. Uh, so that's how long it took to get this through. Now, during the debate yesterday, there was a large consensus from all political groups and from all institutions to welcome a text that everyone does agree on. And uh, I, I think it's um, understandable that this is a good step uh, toward protecting whistleblowers and toward protecting European democracy. And uh, also that this is something that is uh, on behalf of the common good in Europe and uh, for European citizens. Now, let's not forget the, that uh, there were a lot of uh, chains in the link that led to this being passed. We had a real debate on it. There was real political tension as regards whether or not we needed a European directive on whistleblowers. And I am pleased uh, that we had really good continual mobilization. Some people are here today. So we had mobilization from NGOs, civil society. And the political weight of Parliament in promoting this idea of an EU whistleblower's protection wouldn't have been as significant without that mobilization by NGOs. So I really want to underline that collective aspect of this. Uh, there was a, a real cooperation between the European Parliament and civil society. And of course, now we have the results. So the proposal was in 2018. The proposal uh, was a, a good proposal from the outset that came from the Commission. Of course, there were some concerns that we had, but overall it was good. And then Parliament wanted to take this as far as possible. And uh, we really wanted to have as ambitious protection for whistleblowers as possible. There were different issues that were controversial. Uh, we, these came up again as we uh, uh, came to the end of the process. They were publicly debated. And uh, I have to also underline the fact that there was a lot of public interest in this text, and that was clear in the public debate that took place, both at European and national levels. And some member states had uh, uh, perhaps a different view of what protection for whistleblowers should be, in particular as regards conditions for protection and the hierarchy of channels. Uh, do uh, problems need to be identified first to the employer or first to a certain organization, or can they go straight to um, an external organization, for example? The parliament got its position through and brought the council around to its position on this. Parliament is often considered to be the weak, uh, weaker side in these types of negotiations, but I think during this negotiation in particular, parliament really demonstrated that it is able to um, use its full weight to its advantage and uh, to use its full weight to benefit the European citizens, who, of course, the parliament di uh, directly represents. So this directive uh, works at a sectoral level and also at personal level of whistleblowers. So they're personally uh, protected, and that includes consultants or um, subcontractors or interns, etc. Um, there's also um, a two-part protection. First, uh, a protection against retaliation. 
um, uh, burden of proof, the reversal of burden of proof. So the employer has to uh, demonstrate uh, that um, if the if if the whistleblower has had some sort of retaliation that is not linked in any way. And then there's also a more legal side of things with the clear um, where the whistleblower has to clearly uh, um, be protected, um, even if uh, we're talking about secret or confidential information, there's still this principle that that person's actions are made legitimate because whistleblowing has a higher uh, legal protection. And that's really important for effective protection of whistleblowers. We'll wait to see how transposition will take place in member states. They have two years to do it, so that brings us to 2021. I think there's a lot of follow-up and monitoring that needs to be done, but of course I think we can trust in NGOs to um, really make sure that everything is um, transposed uh, satisfactorily. We hope that this transposition will take place as quickly as possible. We're limited by EU competencies here. And um, so... We hope that certainly all the potential in the text will be made use of. And that's it, I think. So I'm happy to take your questions. Yeah, please go ahead and please state your name and the meeting. Anna Pandensky, Europe Diplomatic. J'ai la question concernant. I have a question relating to the impact of your um, work on the destiny of Mr. Assange. I was wondering whether you think this is going to have an impact on him, whether you think it'll save him from the situation he finds himself in at the moment because he's in prison at the minute. Uh, well, um, unfortunately, um, this is just at the stage where it's um, been approved. It's not going to be able to be um, transposed for a while, and uh, we're not going to be able to have any kind of retroactive action on it. Um, um, so unfortunately, what we're doing here isn't applying, going to apply to Mr. Julian Assange. Of course, his situation is a bit specific anyway. Um, we're relating to uh, release of mass information through a uh, platform. And we would absolutely welcome a lot of the information um, that did come out that absolutely helped with a lot of uh, work from journalists. But unfortunately, at this stage, I, I'm not going to be able to say that um, what we're dealing with is going to help uh, Mr. Assange. I think um, Mr. Assange's point needs to be dealt with at a political level. Um, if he does get extradited to the U.S., then it will be at a political level that it's dealt with. Okay. I have two questions. First, you mentioned the need for this to be as horizontal as possible. Could you say exactly what you mean by that? Uh, what would uh, that be exactly? And then also, the today's vote will then be followed by a corridendum vote. Uh, is there a risk that the next vote... Uh, will somewhat reopen the file, and uh, should it just not be approved then? Well, on the horizontal transposition, it might seem a bit technical, in fact, but when member states transpose text, I mean, we're talking about a lot of different sectors of activity, and each of them has their own regulatory specific framework. So the member states will have to change their sectoral um, legislation one after another so that the provisions of the directive can take effect across all those sectors. Now, the framework must follow the framework of the directive, but we can encourage member states, and in fact, member states have uh, said um, that they would do this, that they can take general horizontal provisions that would apply independently uh, in predefined um, sectors, but without having to go into each sector and reworking uh, the framework specific for that is specific for that sector. So what we're talking about in that case is that whistleblowers would have protection over um, uh, many fields, perhaps even more than those defined in the European directive. Now, on the Corridendum, yes, the different uh, language versions, uh, well, the um, lawyer linguists haven't um, completed everything in the time necessary, so we still have to see the different language versions of the directive. And in theory, I mean, uh, there's uh, never zero text, but I think this is a uh, risk, rather. But I think this is the case for many texts. But I, I can't say 
100%. I mean, anything can happen, but uh, we're, we, we have confidence that it will simply be a procedural vote in the end. And uh, pretty much it'll be the same as how it's happened for many other texts we've had over this uh, parliament. Apologies for coming back to a question that's already been asked. But I think that there is some information um, that is important for people to know. I know that uh, your colleagues have been dealing with something. And you were talking about the possibility of offering asylum in uh, Europe. You said that the... Um, rules can't be applied straight away but i was wondering honestly what you think about this particular case do you think that protection should be provided in europe or do you think that we should let him be extradited this is a very specific case and i'm sure you know better than i do here we're not just talking about a whistleblower there's something else is there's kind of a double-sided thing here. Uh... Well, if we stick to the spirit of the legislation and the aim of the text that we adopted today, Julian Assange would be protected. It wouldn't be Europe that would provide asylum. Europe can't do that. What a member state would have to. I don't really know um, how that would work. You would have to find um, a member state uh, with the support of the others that would then uh, provide asylum to uh, Mr. Assange. We've seen in the past in um, with issues like this that member states have been a little bit reluctant um, to deal with this. But I think um, we should give him asylum um, in relation to the extradition demand from the US. I would have a different opinion um, when it comes to Sweden. Firstly, because um, in terms of whistleblower protection, Sweden is one of the countries at the forefront of this um, in the EU. And then the issue with Sweden is sexual harassment and rape. Um, I think regardless of um, any whistleblower protection, I think this, uh, these accusations are well outside that. I think it would make sense for uh, Mr. Assange to go to Sweden and face those charges. But that is um, a, something entirely apart from the whistleblowers issue. But you appreciate that there are contradictions, there are different opinions here within the US, that even in the US they've got different opinions. Are there any more questions? If that is not the case, then just to let you know that there's a press release in 23 languages available outside the press room and online. And uh, if that's all, then I'll just say thank you very much for attending this press conference. Bye. Merci.